Hello everyone. I've done numerous uh, interviews in the past few years with uh, you know several uh, musicians, but I've never done an interview with so many people all at once. <laughs> right? A writer, a physician, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a tour manager, a yeah. drummer. Yeah. A <laughs> uh, record label, a shirt company, yeah, a baking I, company, <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, uh, lightning and sound. Uh, lighting and sound, yeah, a production company. Production. Uh, uh, a charity a, worker. A charity worker. Uh, creator of Office Based Anesthesiology in New York City. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I've done a few things. Welcome to Quebec City, sir. Ah, thanks, Brad. I think I, it's your second visit, is it? It's our second visit, and I enjoyed the couple of hours we just spent where you showed us the old city. That was wonderful. It was great. Went up there to right around the Citadel and on the St. Lawrence and yep. stuff. Enjoyed it very much. So, so a thank little you bit. Uh, thank you for that. So a little bit warm from the hot weather? It's a little bit warm, yeah. I mean, you know, we down in Woodstock, as you hear, have had a couple of uh, uncomfortable heat waves, let's say. <laughs> you know, usually where I live, it's not so bad even in the summer, because no matter how hot it gets during the day, it cools off at night, and I'm sure that's similar here. But this new terminology I now hear, yeah. now it's called the heat dome. <laughs> which seems to be covering us, and that prevents the temperatures from going down at night, and it's sticky and uncomfortable. I but see. I guess, I don't know how you feel about it, but uh, I certainly think that it has something to do with uh, our manipulation of the environment and climate change, quote unquote. <clears throat> Good chances. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Maybe not specifically today's heat, but the trends, the patterns, the hotter hots, the colder colds, is what it is. Today I'm interviewing, like I said, a lot of people all at once. Uh, he's called the Rock Doc, which is amazing. I, I like the name. As you know from my story, I had a career in rock and roll, and then I switched and decided to follow another dream I had as a child, which was to go and become a doctor. So that was a long road, almost a 10-year road, yeah. of a lot of schooling, of medical school in Mexico, many years of residency, because I thought I wanted to be a surgeon until I switched into anesthesiology. And after all of that, when I was about, I would say maybe eight months, nine months from finishing my anesthesia residency, I decided that I didn't want to be a doctor anymore. <laughs> I was so tired of all those years of schooling and, and all those years in hospital. Hospital residencies are hard. Oh. And a surgical residency, which I did for two years, was particularly hard because back in those days, you were on call either every other night or every third night. Um, and you were at the hospital from, <clears throat> I don't know, six in the morning to late at night, and then you had to be back the next day. Yeah. So you, you never had any time. It was very grueling. And I really had second thoughts about whether or not I had made the right decision. What am I going to do, though? <laughs> you know, I just spent all this time, and I did enjoy medicine. Um, MTV had just come out around that time. It was the early 80s. And I noticed that major uh, news stations, major networks, we're all getting medical representatives, on-camera medical representatives. Um, and so I, I knew MTV was a new network, and I knew the kind of population that it appealed to. And my thought was, well, why isn't there a doctor for them? You know, why can't, why can't I be the rock doc? the doctor for the rock and roll generation and, and what my plan was was I would go and I would pitch MTV on an idea that I had of being the rock doc and what the rock doc was back then what my idea was is that I would pick some sort of a topic that related to the MTV generation a health related topic 
Uh, and then I would do a story on it. I'd write a story on it, and then I'd get a rock star to have a conversation with me about that story. Um, and I thought that would be perfect for MTV. I knew MTV already had a little bit of content other than videos. They had a guy named Kurt Loder, <clears throat> who was a guy who did the news. Now, of course, it was music news, right? It wasn't news news. But I just thought it would be perfect. And I met a lawyer. I knew a lawyer from my time in the music business who had some connections. And I told him of my plan. He said, well, go and make it, and I'll get you up there. And I got Carl Palmer from Emerson, Lake and Palmer to, to be the interview for me. And I picked a story. Back in the day, you know, people didn't run for exercise. That was a relatively new phenomenon. And it came about largely because of a man named Jim Fix. Jim Fix was a runner who realized the health benefits of running and, and wanted to popularize running for the common person, not yeah. just for a racer. And he wrote a book, and it became a very popular book, and people started to realize that, I suppose, fast walking, walking, and, and jogging was a real viable way of getting healthy health, okay? And he was the poster boy for it. And he spoke, and he did races, and he went out and he talked, and then one day he was running, and he was, I think, in his early 40s, and he dropped dead. And it was like, huh? This is, this is the health guy. <laughs> What's yeah. the story here? And, and basically, when they did an autopsy, they realized that he had a significant amount of arteriosclerosis, which can be somewhat hereditary, but also, as we know now, uh, eating fats, cholesterol, things like that, it's certainly... Back then, we didn't know, you know. Yeah. Medicine keeps changing, I don't know if you've noticed. You know, one year they'll tell you this is good, and then five years later they'll say, oh no, you shouldn't be eating that. It wasn't so good after all, we were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not sure healthy eating was part of that plan back then. He had some hereditary heart disease that he didn't know about. He had hereditary atherosclerosis, which is when you have the plaques, the cholesterol plaques, the narrowing of the vessels and he had a major heart attack that killed him. And so the point of my story was, here's somebody who you were sure was the picture of health. Yeah. But he wasn't the picture of health. So every once in a while, go to a doctor. <laughs> Even if you're exercising and you think you're doing well and you feel great, get some blood tests, get an examination once a year. And that was gonna be the point of that particular story. I thought it was a great way to start Absolutely. off. Absolutely. Um, went up to MTV, he got me, he got me a meeting with the program director at MTV. I pitched the story, played him the Carl Palmer interview, he loved it. He said, the only problem is we're supported by record companies, and the record companies are not going to sponsor this kind of content. So if you can go out and get us a sponsor that'll pay for you to be on MTV doing this, I'll put you on the air tomorrow. But of course, that's not an easy thing to do, yeah. and I couldn't do it, and uh, so the idea kind of died then, but this picture <clears throat> was taken for that, not many years later when I wrote the book. I had this, and when I showed it to people, they said they freaked out, and they said, well, if you're going to write a book, that should be the cover. <laughs> and Absolutely. so the picture comes and from it's that a nice whole. picture. Yeah, well, it was just this great melding, the white lab coat and the little drum kit, yeah. you know, and it kind of set it all. <clears throat> so that's where Rock Doc came from. And then, of course, many years later, <clears throat> when I decided to write the book, uh, it seemed to be the perfect title. And, you know, when I showed people the picture, they said, geez, that could be a great cover. <laughs> See, and like we're a profile prog, you know, it, it mm -hmm. says it all, prog, we're dedicated to progressive rock, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, reviews, interviews and all that. So, you know, most of my questions will be prog related, but I know you had like that, sorry the term, but crazy life. Yes. So there's some things that cannot go unnoticed. So I, Whatever you want, Fred, I'm here to talk. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> This book here mm -hmm. was just released back in January, January of this year. January, yeah. uh, who was it intended to? 
who was your supposed to be your public? Michael Jackson's fan, rock fans, people that want to know about medicine. You know, kind of all of the above. Certainly, there's a reasonable amount about Michael Jackson in the book. Mm -hmm. You know, I spent uh, eight years on and off with Michael, uh, both as a friend, somewhat of a confidant, I think, and certainly as a as a physician. And so. Um, because he was such a misunderstood person, because I felt that what people got from the press wasn't the real Michael, yeah. uh, I felt as my friend, I wanted to tell people about the Michael that I knew. In relation to Michael, I also had a story that I thought was very important for the public to know. Absolutely. I, was, I was very upset at how Michael's life ended, as many of us were. Um, and I, in the book, it will really explain how propofol came about, how it was a lit legitimate treatment, you know, real medical treatment from a real doctor who was a real expert at it. Uh, it was done successfully for eight years on and off, uh, and then unfortunately it was corrupted at the end. And, and for my friend Michael, I didn't want people to feel like he was this crazy drug addict who was addicted to this wild drug and he had to go find somebody who would give him this drug or he, or he couldn't perform. That's not the story. And I know that's the story that many people were left with. And so even though I thought that I would take a lot of crap because I was going to tell the story, um, I was uh, comfortable enough and I felt strongly enough that it was necessary for me to do it in the memory of Michael. And just, you know, in life, we go through life, right? And crazy things happen in the world. And all we know is what we read in the press. Absolutely. Right? And many, many of those stories we'll never know. But I felt I had one of those stories, and because of that, I was obligated to tell it, and so I did. <laughs> and you did well. Yeah, so Michael was certainly one of the reasons I told, you know, I wrote the book. The old rock and roll stuff, you know, I mean, you know being a Prague guy, that the days of Prague rock were some of the most exciting, interesting days of rock and roll. Absolutely. Um, and again, I had the stories. So if I had the stories, it was my obligation to tell them so that people really could get a sense of what it was really like. Yeah. Uh, so that was number two. Number three, you know, I've had both good and bad things happen to me in my life. You know, it's not all, all rosy. I was a drug addict. I went to jail. Um, I've lost all my money at times. Uh, but through it all, I've learned some great lessons. Uh, and I think... You know, I, I love to share that with people so that maybe, you know, they can use it in some way to make their life a little better. Not better, better. <laughs> and then lastly, uh, as you know from reading the book, I've devoted a lot of time and effort to charity work. Yeah. Um, Impressive. And I, thank you. Appreciate that. And I realize now that giving back is one of the most important things you could do in life. And so it's a message that I really want people to get, you know. You, you would be amazed at how great it makes you feel to make someone else feel good. Yeah. To give somebody a little less fortunate than you something. And again, the best ones are anonymous acts of kindness. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Because it's not about you. And it's not about you getting the credit for what you did. But it's just about standing in the background and looking at the, uh, the joy, looking at the elevation of a life um, yeah. that you can actually do uh, if you get involved in the right way and you really devote yourself to it. And, and your intentions are in the right place. Yeah. And, and well, the end of the book says it all like about giving back. Yes. Like you're very, like, you want to give that strong message at the end of the book. You know, it's all about giving back. It is. And that's one message that you got a lot from very important people, right? I Michael did. and I did. Mandela. And, Michael right? and Mandela and, and various other people that I met around the world through the charity work that I did that selflessly gave and, yeah. and just 
provided such great opportunities for people. And I learned also that charity is not just about giving money. I mean, a lot of people think that's what it's about. But to really get the benefits, you need to get your hands dirty. You need to go in the trenches and do something. Volunteer, do something, create something, help somebody create something, and see how meaningful that is to you and whoever you're working with. We all have dreams. Yes. Your dream was to be a drummer. It was. So you joined in the music industry in order for you to find a drum set to play on, basically. <laughs> I had hoped it would go that way, and then, yeah. And after like such a short t time frame, you became tour manager mm -hmm. for Edgar Winter mm -hmm. for Emerson Lake and Palmer, one mm -hmm. of the greatest bands in the, in, you know, of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, you, like, how is it even possible, like, for just in so fast to become you know, a tour manager for such a band? It, it all happened. You're right, very quickly, and it was through a uh, quirky set of circumstances. In most cases, I don't know. Call it karma. Call it luck call it being at the right place at the right time. I'm not sure what. But it all started for me um, wanting to be a drummer, certainly as I grew up, and trying to be a drummer through high school and playing in bands and things like that. But, you know, how many people really make it at that age? Yeah. <laughs> and I wasn't one of them, and my other dream was to be a doctor, so I went off to university. But then in between my sophomore and junior year of university, uh, I took an apartment in New York City, in the East Village of New York City, with the summer of 1969, which was an amazing summer to be in the East Village of New York City. Um, and I was in New York because I was training in a program which would have given me a license to be an operating room technician, which I felt would have been an advantage in getting into medical schools. Medical school is very difficult to get into. Yeah. So we were all looking for some way to have something extra on the resume that would sort of attract a medical school's attention, I thought that would be it. Uh, but it couldn't have been two more opposite worlds, you know, living in the East Village and then working a training program in a hospital uptown that was quite different. Uh, shortly after I moved in, I started hearing music coming from my upstairs neighbors. And of course, being a musician, I felt like I had to go and check it out. Went up there. Uh, this guy opens the door, he's got long hair, kind of short, I don't really recognize him, he's got a guitar slung over his shoulder, he invites me in, you know, he's goofing around, and we start talking, he tells me his name is Rick Derringer. Now I knew that name, I said, Rick Derringer, you mean the McCoys? He said, yeah, the McCoys. We're in New York because now we've just been signed on. He was there with the bass player from the McCoys and his brother, who had been the drummer of the McCoys. And they were going to be the new band for this guitar phenom, uh, this albino, white albino guitar player that had just hit the scene from Texas named Johnny Winter. And they had been hired to be Johnny Winter's band. And so he was in New York working with uh, Johnny. And Rick and I became fast friends and hung out, and he turned me on to all his friends, and I met Johnny once, and I met uh, some of the people that he worked with, his manager and stuff like that. But what was most interesting was Rick was very connected to the Andy Warhol scene. And so all these Andy Warhol crazies would come to his apartment, uh, went down to the factory once or twice, they started coming to my apartment, so it was a crazy, crazy summer. And when, when I finished the summer, I asked Rick to get me a job as a drummer. Because <laughs> he had heard me play drums. Yeah. Uh, I had a little band that summer. He knew I could play. And then eight months later, he called me up and was talking about Johnny's brother named Edgar and a new band. And I was really ready for him to ask me to be the drummer. And he says, we want you to be the road manager. The road manager? What's a road manager? What are you talking about? He explained it to me and he said, take it, you never know. And I took the job and that started me on a five, six year course in the uh, business end of the rock and roll business, somewhere I never expected to be. It, so at that time, there was no genre in particular you wanted to play music. 
Like there, he well, didn't want to play music like in a progressive rock band. It could have been pop or. My personal taste as a drummer back in those days was actually uh, R and B and funk. When I was in um, high school, I was in a band called the Knights of Soul. So I was really. Uh, that would have been the ideal for me. And and really, Edgar's band was like that. I don't know if you're familiar with his first band, Edgar with yeah. his white trash. But that was a great band. Horns and just southern soul band, you know, sort of like an Allman Brothers kind of thing with horns maybe. Or They were a great band, so that, that would have worked for me. <laughs> but no, no. Uh, um, the music business was the music business, yeah. and I was okay with all of it. With Emerson and Ken Palmer in particular, because you were the tour manager, yes, you must have felt a lot of pressure. Traveling the world, you know, being responsible for so many people, because we, we all know how big the tour was, and how many people were involved in equipment and all that. For three musicians, for they, three, for three musicians, three musicians unreal, unreal. they had a heck of a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think Keith's stuff alone almost took a, a half a trailer. Yeah. You know, all his keyboards and his moogs and his his organs and all, all that stuff. And of course, Carl had this ridiculous drum set with his two big guns. Heavy. When I, I'll never forget, <laughs> heavy, he had a hand-carved stainless steel drum set yeah. worth I don't know how much money it was worth but it was serious it was serious and you know Greg was probably the lightest of the three you know just with a couple of amplifiers and maybe ten guitars or something but yeah it was a uh, it was very high pressure and don't forget Fred this was in the day before cell phones before yeah. computers no internet no internet no nothing made it twice as difficult to try and communicate and to yeah. try and just make sure everything was the way you needed it to be and if it wasn't and you had to get replacements or something went wrong there was a whole lot more running around than today you know asking Siri or Google or yeah. whatever and you know you blow an app and you blah 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 or whatever it wasn't like that then no, no. very intense and you didn't have the you know the uh, experience working with you know, small bands and building your experience up to Only, working with... Well, Edgar. Edgar gave me a lot of experience because I was with Edgar for a year. And when we started, he was a very unknown commodity. But by the time we finished, he was starting to get known. So I had really um, okay. seen things from the bottom starting to elevate. Of course, Emerson, Lake and Palmer was a different thing, yeah. you know, because they were a super group. You know, and I had not been with the super group, and I think I say in the book, you know, it went from, you know, station wagons to limos, <laughs> economy commercial seats to Learjets. <laughs> so, yeah, that was different. <laughs> it's, you talk about, well, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer for sure, but you also talk uh, briefly about uh, Pink Floyd. But in between or during that period of time, mm -hmm. there's also bands you work with mm -hmm. which are not mentioned in the book. Mm -hmm. I read I read that somewhere. Like Gen Genesis, ACDC? Well, AC if I'm wrong. No, no, no ACDC. Uh, Genesis, yes. We did a small tour for Genesis early on. We did a small tour for the Bee Gees early on. Not big things though. The first big thing we did when I had the company was ELP. Uh, and then we did ELP, we did Floyd, we did T-Rex, we did Three Dog Night. And then, of course, prior to that, uh, I had been with Edgar and Johnny. Mm -hmm. And then I worked for a manager named D. Anthony. And so I had gone out with Humble Pie, Jay Giles, Peter Frampton. <laughs> Unreal. Yeah. So all of them. But don't forget, back in those days, a lot of these tours were package tours in that three groups. And they essentially did all the same gigs because they were booked by at that time they were booked by premier talent was okay. was the real yep. talent agency frank barcelona you know i like to i think i talked about it in the book you know when i started working for d anthony who was this major manager it was like there were three guys there was d there was bill graham who of course was the 
premier promoter in the U.S. with his film *More East and West* and *Winterland*, and of course he went on to various other things. He he helped. Uh, he was the stage manager basically for Woodstock, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and uh, then there was Frank Barcelona, who had the talent agency. Okay. Uh, and the Stones and Zeppelin and ELP, and they were all signed to Frank, and you know they would put together these tours. So over the course of time, you know. I toured, not directly working for them, but I mean, Tull, um, Alice Cooper, uh, I mean, there were so many, you know, that you do like three, four gigs with, so you yeah. felt like you were on tour with them as well to a certain extent. And sometimes you would interact, sometimes you wouldn't interact. Yeah. Allman Brothers did a lot, of, a lot of gigs with the Allman Brothers. So he, you know, I in those years, and we did a couple of big festivals, so I interacted with many, many different groups. Yeah. Any rock fan would feel blessed if they could attend one date during the uh, Dark Side of the Moon tour. You worked the tour. Yeah. Like, what was exactly your mandate? Well, when Peter Watts called me, Peter, I had met Peter years before that when I first moved to England. And we had become good friends. And, and as I think I told you, and it's in the book, he, when I came up with this idea of an all-in-one production company, and I told Peter, he helped me significantly because I was not a technical guy. I was not a sound and light guy. I was finances, organization, transportation, all of the other stuff. And I really needed to partner with people who, who were technologically sound. Yeah. And Peter knew a company called Kelsey Morris that was breaking up, Jim Morris and Bill Kelsey. And he knew Jim was keeping the equipment, and he thought that I could probably make a deal with Jim. And they had top of the line, most technologically advanced equipment. They were getting ready to, to put out the first digital light board, first traveling digital light board. And so uh, Peter, hooked me up with Jim, and uh, then we formed this company. Now, we started to solicit business, and I said, as I said, we did Genesis, we did Bee Gees, and then we did this huge ELP tour that I told you about. Yeah. We, we built them a theater. Uh, towards the end of that tour, I got a call from Peter, and I could tell he was upset. He was on the road, he tells me the story, he says, you know, we're doing this album, which is well finished, but we wanted to take it on a short English tour first, just to see, and I want to do all these things, and Arthur Max, the lighting guy, wants to do all these things, and I can't do it, I don't have enough equipment, just don't have enough equipment, and I know if, if your equipment was here, if you guys joined us, I could do what I want. <clears throat> I've already sort of made the entree with Steve O'Rourke, the manager, and uh, when we get back to London, I want you to meet with him and make a deal. You're coming on the next leg of the tour. And the next leg was right when the album was released in March of 73. It was the American leg. And our mandate was, you know, to... Now, I was not running the soundboard. I was not running the lights. You know, again, my mandate was organizational. Okay. You know, make sure the trucks got where they were supposed to go. You know, make sure the roadies were cool. Make sure my equipment worked. Yeah. It was in tip-top oh, yeah. shape. Uh, and just from that standpoint, you know, that was a massive amount of work and responsibility uh, just to do that. And so that was basically what our mandate was. Now, individual guys in my crew, though, you know, I mean, uh, I had sound guys and lighting guys, of course, under the guise of Peter and Arthur. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we probably had a crew of 30, maybe back in the day then, which was a lot of people, a lot of people. Wow. We were traveling with probably close to, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 people, I don't even know. Wow. I don't even know. I know on the ELP tour we had 20 tons of equipment. Unreal. Yeah. So. Unreal. <laughs> uh, I talked to you about, um, you know, on our social network, uh, I asked people if they have questions for yes. you, right? And, right? and a few did. Okay. Let's well, actually, go. quite a bit did. Okay. 
so I picked three of them. Okay. I like the most, and uh, here they are. Uh, what band or artist was the easiest and the most pleasant to work with? What band and the artist was the easiest to work with? You know, in some ways, Jake Isles. <laughs> Jake Isles. <laughs> the Jake Isles band. You know, I took them to Europe for the first time. They were uh, second on the bill to Emerson Lincoln Palmer. And it was just so much fun. I just had such fun with those guys because, you know, they were all, you know, bright eyed and none of them had ever been to Europe before. And of course, they were so grateful to be the undercard to ELP. They were, a, they were a pleasure. They were incredibly easy to deal with. <laughs> nice, nice. Are there any decisions you made which you regret? Something you wish you could turn the clock counterclockwise? In terms of my life or the rock and roll business or what? Uh, let's go rock and roll. Rock and roll. Um, or even in, in your life as a general. You know, um, hindsight is twenty twenty vision. You know, I could go back and say this and say that, but I, you know, I've had this incredible life and I wouldn't want to erase any of it. Yeah. So I'm going to say no. I like that. <laughs> uh, you were very active in the music industry during the greatest and the most uh, creative years of progressive rock. Uh, that's in the 70s. Yes. Uh, would you, how would you explain the rise and fall of progressive rock? Mm. Well, you know, it's very funny because I think part of what helped it rise helped it fall. And, and the part that I'm going to say is technology. You know, prog rockers were some of the first digital musicians of sorts mm -hmm. because they were some of the first to use synthesizers and various things, right? Yep. But as we moved on towards sampling and various other forms of digital technology, I think people lost interest in that form of music to a certain extent. And when you look at 80s, right? You have a lot of synth pop, right? Yep. Okay. This that came out of prog rock, but couldn't have been more different than prog rock. Absolutely. <laughs> and so I think it was a real paradoxical double-edged thing. And I think that was part of the death knell. Also, like that. also, the other thing is, you know, FM radio helped prog rock a lot. Because a lot of the prog rockers had material that certainly didn't fit in with the three-minute commercial pop genre. Yeah. Right? And FM stations were not that. <laughs> they were all about extended play, unusual music, mm -hmm. different kinds of things. But as corporate America came into radio and playlists were developed and FM stations became way more under control, that didn't help the prog rockers. And if you look, a lot of the prog rockers then, much to the dismay of their fans, went into a much more commercial direction yeah. where they weren't so prog. I mean, I guess Genesis is almost the best example. You know, once Peter Gabriel left, Phil Collins at the helm, yeah. and a lot of people got very upset at what happened next. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. You're totally right. Right. And so I think that was another, another aspect of it. People wanted to make money. You know, they could make money in the 70s as prog rockers. When you got into the 80s and 90s, they had to be a whole lot more commercial if they wanted to make money. Or clever, like the Grateful Dead, who never gave a shit about being commercial, yep. but toured 275 days a year and, and did things in a totally different way than anybody else and still made a great living doing what they did in their own way. And there were groups that were able to do that, but in general, you know, that's how I sort of see that transition. Yeah. Uh, back to my questions. Go I, I cannot go unnoticed your um, your relationship with Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. You know this book is filled with anecdotes, mm -hmm. sad stories, mm -hmm. funny stories, mm -hmm. like the one in the hotel, yeah, yeah. President Suite. Yeah. 
Uh, very, very nice pictures with Mandela, uh, you working in uh, found fundraisers, uh, charity. Well, also me actually in clinics in Africa that we created. <clears throat> very, very nice. So, I know you spent a lot of time with the legend, yes. uh, you know, the king of pop. So, um, talk to me about Michael. So, I met Michael in a medical sense initially. You know, I was director of anesthesia in a clinic, uh, plastic surgeon's office, and he came in for a procedure. And immediately, he and I had a certain simpatico, you know what I mean? And I'm sure this and this, the earring and the ponytail, you know, uh, this was in the 90s. I didn't look like a doctor, I didn't talk like a doctor, I didn't have stories like a doctor. And so it was easy for Michael and I to relate because I was a real music guy. You know, and he was interested. When he heard I was on the Dark Side of the Moon tour, he knew about that. Mike was a music guy. Oh, yeah. And he had a million questions. What was this? What was this? You know? And so it was easy for us to hit it off on that level. On another level, though, which people probably don't expect or don't know, Michael was spiritual. Michael cared about those kind of things. He read and listened to a lot of self-help stuff. I have a history of that through working with a shaman, through being involved with tribal people in various places. And so we connected on that level as well. And we would trade. I talk about that in the book. He would actually turn me on to things. I would turn him on to things. And that was, that was a terrific thing as well. Um, and, you know, Michael liked doctors. <laughs> I bet he did. He liked doctors, uh, I'll be honest with you. But um, again, I was a different kind of doctor. And even medically, we could talk on a different level than he could with his other doctors. And so, you know, all of those things built into a relationship. And I think one more thing that was really important, I loved Africa and he loved Africa. You know, people forget that Michael was a black man. Believe it or not, he might not have looked like one, but he was a black man. And he related to black people and he was very touched by the whole Africa experience. Uh, so much so that he wanted to ultimately at least have a place there. You know, when I say live there, you know, guys like that live everywhere. But he definitely wanted to spend much more time there and he wanted to have a place there. And again, I think what people don't realize is the, the depth of his relationship with Nelson Mandela. You know, it was almost like a father-son relationship. And it was, it was an amazing thing to be able to see firsthand. And I thank him uh, for allowing me, letting us, my wife and I, into that world, for introducing us to Mandela. I mean, it, made a huge difference in my life and other people's lives because we actually got to start a charity and Mandela helped us, you know, finance the first project. So, you know, I thank Michael for that. And if Michael had stayed alive, we had talked about doing something together. You know, we always went to hospitals together and things like that. And, you know, our children. You know, any time we travel, Michael would go to two places in that city. One, a children's hospital, two, a bookstore. He had this thing with books, and I talk about it yep. in the book, because he had a woman who took care of him when he was in the Jackson 5 called Rose Fine, this Jewish woman. She was into books, and she turned Michael on to books, and, and you know, we would always go to bookstores, and when you'd go to his room in, a, in the hotel or his suite, there'd be piles of books. Not that he'd read them all, but he loved them so much he'd just buy them. <laughs> so, you know, he, he was so different than what people think, you know, and um, that's the Michael I knew, and that's the Michael I wanted to share with, with everybody. And you got to know him, like, personally, behind closed doors, like, I mean, without the cameras. No, and that, we, no, we had, you know, I was very much under the radar until he died, and that's the way I wanted it. You know, yeah. I was not looking for notoriety for being Michael's doctor in any way. I didn't want people to know, as a matter of fact, because it was, it was a private thing, and I think Michael appreciated that. And of course, you know, having that 
position of being not only his doctor but a friend. You know, I was, yeah, we, we spent lots of private time with him, yeah. private dinners. You know, obviously with the propofol, <laughs> you know, I spent uh, time so at night with there. him. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, I spent a lot, a lot of private time. We talked about just about everything. You know, there was nothing that we couldn't talk about. And, and, and about Propofol, you monitored him very, very closely, and that's, that seems to be very important. What you learn, okay, I'm an anesthesiologist, okay. Anesthesiologist is a very unusual type of doctor, if you think about it. We don't treat disease. I don't know that there's any other type of doctor that doesn't treat disease, maybe a radiologist. We don't treat disease. All we do is facilitate the surgeon, if you think about it, right? But we have to know everything about every kind of disease because people with every type of disease show up in the operating room at one point or another. And so um, it allowed me, I forgot why we started, what the question was that you asked, but um, I wanted to characterize anesthesia. I, I, th I thought, I, I talked about um, monitoring. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. the first thing you learn as an anesthesiologist is you're taking control of that patient. Mm -hmm. And you better understand where that patient is at if you're controlling him. And the only way you can do that is by monitoring. So as an anesthesiologist, it's drummed into your head that you must monitor your patient in every way possible. Yeah. Now, when I started as an anesthesiologist, the monitors were not great for office-based anesthesia. Um, fortunately, they got much better quicker, uh, quicker enough for me to uh, use them and become, you know, very much more expert in what I was doing because of the monitors and because of propofol, which was also a miracle anesthetic drug. As an anesthesiologist, I don't know any anesthesiologist that would give drugs to people without monitoring them. Yeah. And without being there 100% of the time. You know, anesthesiologists learn that very quickly because we do it all the time. And all it takes, as we know from Michael, is a few moments of inattention. Even when you think things are going swimmingly. Yeah somebody jerks their head a little bit and all of a sudden the tongue goes in the back of the throat because you don't have a tube in. This is a patient breathing on his own. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't take long to obstruct the airway, have no oxygen to the brain, and then it's over. Yeah. And it's minutes. You know, that's it. It's three minutes. That's it. You know, and so if you're not an anesthesiologist, maybe you don't realize the importance of that until, God forbid, something bad happens to you. We all, well... We all know, or pretty much everybody knows, like, uh, like what, um, how can I say that? Like Michael Jackson's, uh, the movie that came out. Yeah, Leaving Neverland. Um, you know, like the media coverage, which was not always positive, even when he was alive. Correct. Is there anything in that book that you're trying to tell your public? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the Michael I knew was not the Michael that, they saw, if they saw Leaving Neverland, or if they're just reading about Never Leaving Neverland, that's not the Michael Jackson I knew. First of all, I'm a medical professional. Uh, I don't approve of pedophilia. <laughs> you know, I don't condone it. I don't accept it. I don't like it. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible thing. If I had seen any sign of that, uh, or felt in any way that something untoward was going on, I would have stopped it, reported it, made sure it never happened again. Uh, and that was not the Michael I knew. Uh, it just wasn't the Michael I knew. And in the eight years I spent with him, I never saw that kind of behavior, and that's all I can say. You know, I can't speak for the guys in the movie. I didn't know them. Um, but I knew plenty of others. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I knew Macaulay Culkin, and I knew uh, some of the other boys that had grown up that, that hung out with him over, over periods of time and, you know, they were all vehemently in agreement that this was not what they knew and this was horrible, that wasn't the Michael that they knew. So, I feel very badly, you know, he's dead, <laughs> you know, he can't defend himself, you know, and so it's really unfortunate that 
something like this, which was totally one-sided, uh, could just go out there and so many people are just going to believe it because that's the way it was. It was intended for exactly you know, to that. make people think in one, one totally, way, right? Totally. So, it was totally intended to make people believe he was a pedophile, period. See, like, if you would have spent one evening with the guy, you know, but you spent eight years on and off his, his and very doctor, private stuff, friend, as you know, you have the right to 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 say what you think, and and I I think it's good. Well, let me just say this: <clears throat> those guys said they were in his bedroom, so was I. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I saw you've been through a lot. You, I didn't mention anything about. You know, prison uh -huh. and uh, you can. rehab. Well, you can. the thing is, because again, Fred, it, I, I'll tell you why it's important. <clears throat> what I've learned is, you learn the most in life out of the difficult times. Yep. And so, when difficult times happen to you, you've got to stay focused. You've got to be in the moment. Don't go into some terrible depression and some fantasy world. Stay right where you are so that you could get the message, you know. Before I went to prison, I, I worked with a shaman uh, who I actually met when I got out of rehab. It was, it was a crazy story because I was in rehab and I did this grief group, uh, which you do because drug addicts uh, tend to miss events in life, right? Because you're stoned. And so you don't grieve things that you need to grieve, and so you hold on to things that you've never grieved for. Yeah. And so you, you have grief group. And I went to a grief group, and I was grieving about this, that, and the other thing, and the counselor uh, saw something in me. And she, had, she actually knew some of the people that I was talking about, I was grieving for, because it was a man she knew, and I was supposed to go to his funeral in California, and I got stoned and never went. And, and she said, I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to turn you on to somebody that you should start seeing after you get out of rehab. And she turned me on to this amazing man, Charles Lawrence. You probably know the name mm -hmm. yeah. from the book, this modern-day shaman. And uh, I worked with him for many, many years. And when I was ready to go to prison, of course, I wanted to work with him to prepare myself. And we did a lot of, a lot of good work together. Uh, but the day before I was to go, I had my last session with Charles. And uh, he said, okay, so I got two things to tell you. I said, all right. He said, number one, you, because we believe, <laughs> I believe, or my wife believes, he believes, we're co-creators of our reality, right? Yeah. By our intention. You know, whatever intention we put out there, if you put it out strong enough to the universe, then the universe will help that come true. Okay. So, he said, you created this life that you've lived, and you created this situation where you have to go to prison. Here's the good news. <laughs> you created it because there's something that you could get out of it that you could only get in that way. So, please, find out what it is. And then he looked at me and he said, and have a great time. <laughs> and, I, and I thought for a minute, what do you mean? And, but you know what? I got it. He meant stay in the moment, yep. get something out of this. And you did. I absolutely did. got to did. play drum. I got, band. I, I got an amazing amount out of it. I got to play drums in the prison band. I spent 10 weeks in Sweat Lodge with incredible... Uh, spiritual energy mm -hmm. where I could work through everything that had happened to me in life so that when I came out, you know, I wasn't a basket case because I had been in prison. Mm -hmm. And that was another incredible thing. And I learned to cook. That was the third thing. Before I went to prison, my wife said, oh, you should work in the kitchen. And I said to her, what are you, nuts? <laughs> I've been in a cold, windowless operating room for 20 years. Now you want me to go to a hot, windowless room? No way. Well, again, karma, whatever it was we talked about earlier, I got assigned to the kitchen. Couldn't believe it. Uh, and I couldn't believe it. And it turned out to be a, a wonderful experience. And I liked it so much, I went to cooking school when I got out.
<laughs> I have one more question. Go for it, Brad. Who is Neil Ratner in 2019? Because, you know, we, we learn a lot about you in this right. book. Right. But what about today? Well, I think today I have become the embodiment of the rock doc. Today I'm the rock doc. I was never the rock doc before 2019. It was all a work in progress. But I think it's all led up to me now being the rock doc. You know, Love it. with these experiences in rock and roll, experiences as a doctor, and able to share them in many different ways. My Facebook page, YouTube channel, I have a little thing on Radio Woodstock. I'm sitting here talking to you. At some point, I'll go out and speak. That's what I am. That's who Neil Ratner is today. Awesome. He's the rock doc. <laughs> Where can we get your book? Amazon, all formats. Uh, and let me say this. I did the audio book myself. And you know how much dialogue there is in the oh. book. I did all the accents. I worked with a professional director, and it's a kick. How did you do the uh, Michael's laughing? Because <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> It's a kick if you like that, ebook, regular book, but if you would like a signed copy of my book and you're in Canada, <laughs> which you are, you can get it off my website, yep. uh, neilratnerrockdoc.com. Go to the left, there's a little tab that says buy the book. If you buy it there, I will autograph it for you any way you want. and. Um, it would be my pleasure. And it's a great gift. You can, you know, it, you can read it and pass That's it on to your, your family. Absolutely. And, because it's filled with uh, great history and, you know, I loved it. Thank every, you, Fred. Every page. Thank you. Thanks very much, Neil. I appreciate it, Fred. It was a pleasure to have you on Pro uh, And it was a pleasure to do this. And uh, I'll come back again. with your book. And you come and visit us in Woodstock one Absolutely. Day. All right. Cheers. Great. <laughs>